want to talk about two other examples of heat cycles today. Um, the next one is known as the Rankine cycle, and this is very important for steam engines and um, steam power plants, which are very common these days. So this is a cycle where the gas used is water. Right? In this little model Stirling engine, we just use air inside here. So the Rankine cycle uses water, and there's a diagram of the cycle here, which again, you can divide into four ideal kind of stages. So you start off here with cold liquid water. It's pumped up to high pressure. So the pump increases the pressure of the water. So here you've got high pressure water. It then goes into the boiler, denoted by this fire here. That increases the temperature of the water, turns it into steam. So up here you've got very high temperature steam by the time you get to the top. You then use the steam to drive either a turbine or a piston to do the actual work, pushing the engine or whatever. Then finally, the steam, as it does work, the temperature drops. You collect it again in this thing known as a condenser, extract the heat out of it, and turn it back into liquid water. So one more time, as the water goes around this cycle, it starts up here as cold liquid water, it's pumped up to high pressure, it's heated to high temperature, it does work in the piston or the turbine, it cools down in the condenser and turns back into liquid water. So this is known as the Rankine cycle. And we can draw an idealized version of it again, similar to the one we did for the Stirling engine. Okay. So I've done four stages there, one, two, three, and four. You start off in stage one, you pump the water to high pressure. Okay? But because water is an in incompressible liquid, even if you push a lot of pressure in it, its volume doesn't change very much. Right? It's nearly incompressible. So the pressure would increase a lot, but the, the pressure would increase a lot, but the volume of the liquid will stay constant. So you get a graph which looks like this. So that's stage one here. So if I write this in stage one, the P increases because of the pump, and the volume is approximately constant because liquid water is nearly incompressible. In the second stage, you heat it up. In this part, it's inside the boiler, so the pressure is at a constant because it's all connected. So the pressure is approximately constant, but you increase the temperature, and as you increase the temperature, it expands, turns into a gas. So the second stage looks something like this. So in the second stage, the temperature and the volume increase pressure is approximately constant, and it goes from a liquid to a gas. We said the term for that was vaporization, so the water vaporizes. Okay. In the next stage, it actually does work. And we just assume that this stage is quick when the gas is, the steam is going through the turbine or the piston. So therefore, it does work without any transfer of heat. So we assume that the next stage is adiabatic. So stage three, we assume, is an adiabatic expansion. So pressure decreases, volume increases, and the temperature goes down. Adiabatic means Q equals zero, and therefore the temperature will decrease because it's doing work. And then in the final stage, again, it's approximately constant pressure, and you condense it back to liquid water. So in the final stage of the cycle, um, pressure is approximately constant, and the temperature and the volume decrease. Is approximately 
constant. And the steam turns back into a liquid, and we said this is called condensation. So the water condenses. So the liquid, it starts in a liquid somewhere around here. Okay? So between these two points is a liquid. So I draw a graph like this. On this side, we have liquid. And on this side, we have gas. So for this part of the cycle, it's a liquid. And for this part of the cycle, it's a gas. So there's one more very important cycle which I want to talk about which is called the Carnot cycle. And this one, I'll just draw it. It's very simple. It combines two, expansion, two expansions and two compressions. First, you do an isothermal <coughs> expansion. Then you do an adiabatic expansion, remember, that has a higher gradient. Then you do exactly the opposite. So you do an isothermal compression and then an adiabatic compression. So you notice, because this is an isothermal expansion, the temperature along all of this point is constant. Let's call it TH, because it's high temperature. And the temperature along all of these points at the bottom is also a constant. Let's call it TL for low temperature. Now, the Carnot cycle is important for theoretical reasons because you can prove that it maximizes the efficiency of the heat engine. So if you want to know what's the, maxim, what's the maximum efficiency heat cycle, it looks like this. And we will prove this probably next week. So the Carnot cycle maximizes the efficiency any cycle between the two temperatures, so between TL and TH. So if you change the temperature, then you change the possible fix efficiency. Um, but between the fixed temperatures, the Carnot cycle it always has maximum efficiency. And the efficiency of the Carnot cycle we will prove next week is equal to the difference in temperature divided by the maximum temperature. So given that we know that the Carnot cycle has maximum efficiency, you might ask, well, why don't we make every cycle look like the Carnot cycle? So why do we bother with steam engines, which have a cycle which looks like this, when they are always going to be less efficient than a Carnot cycle which looks like this? And the answer to this is practical. It's practically possible and quite straightforward to build an engine which has a heat cycle looking like this. But it's very difficult in practice to build an engine which has a heat cycle looking like this. So theoretically, this is the best. But practically, you always have to um, juggle trying to maximize the efficiency with coming up with a design which is possible to make. Okay, make into a machine. Okay. So the Rankine cycle and the, the Stirling cycle, which I talked about first, are real cycles which you can actually build a machine for. The Carnot cycle is more theoretically important, and it's very difficult to build a real machine which uses the Carnot cycle. Um, so before we finish, there's a few more slides on the presentation I want to show you. So in each of these cases, we need to get the work out of the system, right? So in this case, it's done here by 
in this, well, it says a turbine, or you can also use a piston. In the case of the little Stirling engine here, the work is done by pushing the drive piston up and down, which is turning this wheel. So I just want to show you some examples of how in practice this stage three works. In practice, how do you get the work out? Okay. So that's on the next slide of the diagram. The sim well, one of the simplest ways of doing it is using this thing called a reciprocating piston. So you have high temperature steam, for example, in a steam engine. And the highest temperature steam can go in either side of this piston. So it can either go in this side when you see the arrow here, or it can go in this side when you see the arrow here. Okay. Now the side which is allowed steam to flow into is controlled by these valves. So these funnel-looking things here are valves. And well, the way they work is you can see on the animation So you have this axis along the top, like this, and it has these funny little shapes on it, like this, right, on the top. If you look at that end on, as it were, then you see the axis here, and they have, going around the axis, a shape which looks something like this, which is rotating. And then underneath it, you have the valve. So as this thing rotates, it will push the valve down and let the gas in, and then it will lift the, gas, the valve up again and stop the gas. Okay? So as this thing goes around, the valve goes up and down. Okay. So that's what's shown on the top of this picture here. That these are the valves which are being controlled by this axis here. Okay. So gas can go in from either side. When the gas is going in from this side, it pushes the piston the opposite direction, right? Because the gas is at high pressure. When gas is going in here, it pushes the piston that way. When gas is going in here, it pushes the piston the other way. So you, in, you alternate gas going in from this side, pushing the piston that way. Then gas comes in from this side and pushes the piston that way. And you do it back and forth, right? So you continually put, push the piston back and forth. And then finally, you need to have a space where the gas can go out, and that's this little bit here. So the gas goes in there, pushes the piston, and then escapes. It goes in the other side, pushes the piston, and then escapes. So it pushes the piston back and forth. Okay, so you can do it like that. You can make this more efficient by putting many pistons together. Okay? So what is shown here is just three times this. So this first unit it's the same as this. It pushes the piston back and forth. But then the exhaust gas is fed into another, exactly the same machine, which pushes another piston up and down. And again, it's fed into another machine, which pushes another piston up and down. So in this way, you can increase the efficiency of the engine, because instead of just pushing one piston, it's pushing three pistons, all of which are powering the same um, machine here. You can increase the efficiency in that way. Okay. Um, now, this final diagram has quite a lot going on, so I'll explain it bit by bit. This is showing you the whole setup, okay? so the whole machine. So here, just this part, is the same as the reciprocating piston, which was shown on the previous diagram. So here, you've got the valve, which is either letting gas in this side or in this side. And that's pushing the piston back and forth. The piston is being used to turn a big wheel. In exactly the same way as the Stirling engine, the piston is used to turn a wheel. Okay. The motion of the wheel itself controls the valves. Okay. So both the valve and the piston are connected to this wheel, about 90 degrees out of phase again. So that ensures that the piston is always being pushed in the right direction. And then the final thing, which is quite interesting to explain, is this little spinning thing here. This is known as a governor. And 
the purpose of this is to control the rate of the steam engine. When early steam engines were first, first built, a big problem with, with them was that they were too powerful. So they would get out of control, they would go faster and faster and faster, and then it would break, okay, and you would have a disaster. So this is designed to stop that happening. And it's quite interesting the way it works, so I want to explain it. So the spinning of this is controlled by the spinning of this wheel. Okay? So the faster this wheel turns, the faster this governor turns as well. Now the governor is made up of a spinning axis which has two heavy balls mounted on it like this. Okay? So you can see the balls, one is there, one is there. Okay? So if the governor is at rest, then the weight of the balls just pushes them down to the ground. Okay? But as the governor starts to spin, there's a centrifugal force on the balls, and that will try and pull them out. Right? Exactly the same way as if you spin around, you feel a force pulling your arm out. Right? Now, the faster you spin, the higher and higher these balls will go, because the centrifugal force is getting stronger and stronger. And at some critical point, if the balls go too high, which means that the wheel is going too fast, it will turn off the supply of gas to the turbine. So if the wheel goes too fast, then the balls will raise, and the motion of the balls going up will pull this lever, which turns off the gas going into the turbine, and this shuts down the system. Okay? So this is a mechanical mechanism through which you can stop the engine if it's going out of control, if it's going too fast. OK, so let's begin. Last class, we were looking at examples of what are called heat engines. So we looked at three examples in particular, which were the Stirling engine, the Rankine cycle, which was what you find inside a steam engine, and the Carnot cycle, which I told you is the most efficient possible cycle of heat engine. And today, I want to talk about a related topic, which is heat pumps. So first of all, I'm going to explain what the difference is between a heat engine and a heat pump. So a heat engine is a device which uses a difference of temperature and the transfer, of heat, the transfer of heat from a hot place to a cold place in order to produce work. So schematically, we can draw it something like this. There's a hot reservoir at temperature T2. So we call this the high temperature reservoir. So this will be the steam inside a steam engine, for example. And then there's a low temperature reservoir, which in the steam engine is just the outside world at a lower temperature. And what the engine does is it uses the, trans the flow of heat from hot to cold in order to produce work. So again, schematically, we can draw this in the following way. Here's the heat coming out of there. It flows down to the low temperature reservoir. But some of the heat which flows out is able to be converted into useful work. So there's a, an amount of heat, let's call it Q in, flows in from the high temperature reservoir. An amount of heat Q out flows down into the low temperature reservoir. And you produce an amount of work W per cycle, this is. So conservation of energy tells you that the heat that you get in should be equal to the amount of work you can do plus the heat that you throw out. And using this equation, we define the efficiency as the ratio of W to Q in, which must always be less than 1. Okay. So that's a schematic diagram of what a heat engine is. Now, a heat pump is the same sort of thing, except running backwards. 
So with a heat pump, an example of a heat pump is the air conditioning system. The heat pump takes heat out of a cold temperature reservoir, puts it into a high temperature reservoir, but in order to do this, it must expend a certain amount of energy. So it's the same cycle, but just reversed. So let me draw that. You have, again, the high temperature reservoir. This is a low temperature reservoir. But the cycle is reversed, so we take heat out of the low temperature reservoir and transfer it to the high temperature reservoir. But in order to do this, we have to spend a certain amount of energy. We have to do work. So the work now goes in rather than out. Okay? So we do an amount of work, W, and a certain amount of heat is taken out of the low temperature reservoir, and a certain amount of heat goes into the high temperature reservoir. So it's the same cycle, but just reversed. An example of this is a refrigerator in a fridge. So in the case of a refrigerator, T1 would be the temperature inside the fridge. T2 is the temperature outside in the room. And what the heat pump inside the fridge does is take temperature take heat out of the fridge and put it into the room. And in order to do this, it takes a certain amount of electrical energy, which we call W. Okay. Now, similarly to the way we can find, define an efficiency for heat engines, you can define something similar for heat pumps, which is called the coefficient of performance. coefficient of performance, and we can define it, um, let's give it the symbol C. What you want a heat pump to do is to take lots of heat out for a small amount of energy. Okay. So we define the coefficient of performance as Q out, the amount of heat you can transfer out per cycle, divided by the amount of work that you put in. Okay. So if, this is a, if C is a big number, that means it's a good efficient cycle. You take a lot of heat out for a small amount of work. Okay. But there's a difference between the efficiency of a heat engine and the coefficient of performance of a heat pump. In the case of a heat engine, you must have the efficiency as less than one. Right? Because conservation of energy tells you that the work done must be less than the heat that went into the system. But in this case, you can, at least theoretically, have that the coefficient of performance is greater than 1. In other words, you take out more heat than you put in as work. Okay. Because conservation of energy only reply, requires that Q out plus W equals Q in. It makes no condition on the ratio of Q out and W. Okay, so I want to explain briefly how heat pumps work, and in particular I'm going to explain how a refrigerator, a fridge works. The principle is quite simple, and if you've ever pumped up a bike tire, you will know how it works. If you take a tire on a bike and you have to pump it up, then after you've pumped all the air into it, you will find that the valve, that's the point where you put the air in, becomes hot. Okay? So as you pump in the air, the valve becomes hot. You will also find that later on, if you let all of the air out of the tire, the valve will become cold. So these two facts, when you push gas into high pressure, it increases in temperature. And when you let it go from a high, temperature, high pressure place to a low pressure place, the temperature drops. Okay? This is known as the Joule-Thompson effect, and this is the basis of a refrigerator. So you can imagine it in this way. If I take a bike tire like this, and it's got a valve where you put the air in, right? So if I pump the air in, then this valve becomes hot. And if I let the air out, then this valve becomes cold. So if you want to make a heat pump, all you have to do is put two valves on, like this, 
and then you pump the air into this one, this one gets hot, and then you let the air go out of this one, this one becomes cold. Okay. Then, for example, if you want to make a fridge, you just put this single valve inside the fridge, so the fridge gets colder and colder, and this valve outside the fridge, so this gets hotter and hotter. Okay. In this way, you can transfer heat from here to here. Right, so this is the basic principle, but obviously it doesn't use normal air in the fridge because it's not very efficient. So let me explain in more detail how it works. Let's go with that. Refrigerator. Okay, so this is a fridge, in other words. So I can explain how it works, and it is how I just explain more or less. Here's your fridge. Fridge. Okay, and it's at some temperature T1. Okay, then outside the fridge, this is inside your room, and it's at a temperature T2. Now, in the back of the fridge, there's this heat pump. And there's this thing inside here, which I'll just draw like this, which is called a decompressor. And the job of the decompressor is exactly the same as the valve on a bicycle. The coolant comes into here at high pressure, and the decompressor pss, lets it all out, reduces it down to low pressure. Okay, so the coolant will come in here and go down into low pressure. Okay. And in doing so, it becomes cool, it drops in temperature, and that's how it can take heat out of the fridge. So it comes in here at low pressure. Then outside the fridge on the other side, you have something which is doing exactly the opposite. This is called a compressor. Okay. And the compressor pumps up the pressure of the coolant to a high pressure. Okay. So the coolant flows in here, flows through here at a low pressure, goes into the compressor, and comes out at a high pressure, and therefore high temperature, and then you have to lose that heat, which you've generated through the compression process. So in order to do that, you use a series of pipes which go around the back of the fridge, something like this. So again, the coolant comes in here, flows this way. So that's the general cycle. And if you look around the back of certain, some fridges, particularly old fridges, you can actually see these metal bars around the back of the fridge. And if you touch them, they're hot. So this is where the hot coolant comes out and loses temperature to the air. Okay. The coolant is actually chosen, the chemical use is chosen, so that at room pressure, sorry, at room temperature and the high pressure it's at here, it will actually condense into a liquid. So at some point as it goes around this cycle, it will condense into a liquid. Then when it drops in pressure in the fridge, it will turn into a gas again. So at this point, the coolant condenses. So this is how a heat pump works in practice. Because of the drop in temperature when it goes through the decompressor, heat is taken out of the fridge. So this is Q out, the same as we drew here. And then when it goes through the compressor, it goes to high temperature, higher than room temperature. So heat 
heat is taken out of the gas there, as I've labeled it there. And the work done, W here, is what the, drives the decompressor and the compressor. Right? You have to do work to pump up the pressure of the gas here. OK, so we can draw this cycle um, on a pressure volume diagram, as we did last time. I'm going to briefly do that and explain what happens in each stage. So let's label each stage. I'm going to start by, this is the simplest bit where the liquid is on the outside. So this is stage one, once it's gone through the compressor. So it goes into here. Then stage two, I'm going to label the decompressor, where the pressure drops. Stage three is when it's inside the fridge. And stage four is the compression parts of the cycle. So again, as an idealized system, we can write it in terms of four stages like this. So we start when it's just come out of the compressor. It's just come out of the compressor, so it's at a high temperature, and it's at a high pressure. So it's somewhere up here. Then, as it flows around here, it will cool down because heat is being taken out and going to the room. It does so at constant pressure, so it will move back something like this to a point somewhere here. So this is stage one of the cycle. Then in stage two of the cycle, this is the decompression part, so its pressure rapidly drops. And as it does so, it expands, so its volume increases, something like this. Then it's at low temperature, and it's inside the fridge, so it absorbs temperature from the fridge at constant pressure, again like this. So this is stage three. And the compressor pumps it back up to high pressure and high temperatures. So the compressor makes it go something like this. Okay. And again, as I said, it's liquid for part of this cycle. It condenses here and then it vaporizes when it goes through the decompressor. So for some part of this cycle here, something like this, it's a liquid. So on this side, it's a liquid. On this side, it's a gas. OK, um, before I do that, let me point out something obvious about this. The cycles we looked at last time, the arrows were going clockwise. If you look at the diagrams we do last time, the arrows are going clockwise. Whereas in this case, the arrow is going anti-clockwise. It's going in the opposite direction. That's because these cycles are doing work, whereas in this cycle, work is being done to the system. You're putting energy in. Okay, so that's why it goes in the opposite direction. So a cycle going in this way is acting as a heat pump. A cycle going this way clockwise is acting as a heat engine. Okay. 